ladies and gentlemen, how are we on this fine Wednesday afternoon? I'm feeling a lot better today. If you guys seen my video yesterday that I put up on YouTube, you can tell I was probably still not 100%. Um, I'm just going to transition the screen over for you guys. How are we? This is the second instalment of Candid Pit Stops. We were wanting to do this last week, but we just never got around to doing it. But, well, it's here this week, and it's here for your screen and your enjoyment for today. Today's special guest on Candid Pit Stops is the one and only Jamie O'Connor, who is sitting in the party with me right now. How are you, my friend? Hello, Andrew. Hello, everyone. I'm good. How are you doing? I am doing good. Um, that's... <laughs> I'm so sorry about... The, there's a little bit of an echo on the stream right now. I'm just going to sort that. I think that's it there. So, let's get started, Jamie. Uh, let's start with a little bit of an introduction from yourself. So, who the hell are you, my friend? Who are you? A wanker in some people's eyes. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, 26. I'm um, originally from just outside London. Now live in Wales with my fiance, a type one diabetic, and a um, a footballer and an avid sim racer. Uh, I guess that's the quick way of <laughs> yeah introducing myself. Definitely, and uh, you know, I mean you've got a, you play a massive part in sort of international paddocks sort of framework as well, and uh, I think that's something we'll talk about a little bit further on in the podcast as well we'll sort of mix that in nope. um but yeah let's let's right now so talk about yourself i want to i want to hear about you 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 said you're originally from outside of london so what football team does that mean you support because there's a lot of football teams in london uh <laughs> west ham united andrew <laughs> um how did i guess <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what gave it away, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Maybe the fact that you've got Clarton on, uh, Clarton Blue on everything, so... <laughs> yeah, maybe. Could be. Could be. Um, probably uh, some pretty bubbles in the air as well in the house every now and again, too. But uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, a very, very good way to talk about that is that, so obviously you're a West Ham fan and you sort of play for... You play semi-pro football, aren't you? So amateur semi-pro, yep. were you? Yep. What position uh, so do you play? That's the I question. am a goalkeeper for yep. Johnston Football Club in the Pembrokeshire Leagues. Um, in Division 5 at the moment, but we're going for promotion this season. Oh, so right. hopefully we can uh, we can push on and actually get that done from last season. We got to the Cup semi semi-finals last season as well. and uh, That sounds possible then. Yeah, unfortunately got knocked out in the semi-finals against, uh, who was it against? I can't remember the team, but we played at Milford's ground, and <laughs> yeah, got knocked out, unfortunately. Oh, but I wasn't playing, so. I, re I remember the day that Ross County were promoted to the SPFL, right? That previous year, we had went to see Ross County in the final, the Scottish Cup final. Um, they were in Iron the Iron Brew Division One, that or Iron Brew Championship it was, and the thing is with the Iron Brew Championship at the time is that there was very little funding. There's sort of there's a little bit more funding in it now than there used to be, but you know there wasn't a lot. So it was a big deal when Ross County made it to the finals because at that point we knew that the team had the confidence to go up. So um, that next year we went. We went straight up. There was no messing around. We I don't think we lost many games. We pretty much had a near flawless season, just like how Dundee had last season with them moving up and their sister team, the one that's literally right next door to them, Dundee United, moving down the way. Um, yeah. So it's definitely possible, and I think that's the thing that the, the boys need to keep in mind, isn't it? So. Yeah, um, any, anything's possible in football. So. Definitely, definitely. And I, I mean, all it takes is that sort of like one play to kind of push all that way and uh, one, the one player to be the sort of star player in the team and then the rest of the team sort of follow in suit 
So, yes, we'll exactly. Could could be something as simple as that that pushes you up. So, I like that. I like that. So you said uh, the... I think it's all to do with motivation as well. Yeah, um, I think the boys would be semi motivated, wouldn't they? Because think of it this way: they made it to a, a sort of cup semi final in some ways. Oh so, yeah, we were, we were heartbroken. Yeah. When we got knocked out, the, I don't like talking about it, but the officials gave us nothing that game. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's just a shame it had to end like that, but we just pick up again and go even better this season. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's just about pushing through that sort of adversity, maybe turning that anger into that anger and upset into something of just sort of just motivation and pushing on and playing well, I guess, isn't it? So but, Yeah, for uh, sure. For sure. Let's talk a little bit more about you. So you said that you're a type 1 diabetic. And I I know this story, obviously, because you told me this stuff previously. But it'd be good to know a little bit more about everything. So how old were you when you got diagnosed? And, you know, how did that really affect your life at that time? Because um, um, it's a yeah, difficult you... disease. It's really hard to manage sometimes. So. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, yeah, as you can imagine, I was diagnosed when I was 10, so I was going through... What, was I 10? Yeah, I must have been. I've had it 16 years, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was diagnosed just before my 10th birthday, so happy birthday, Jamie, I guess. Um, yeah, my, my auntie noticed I didn't look well mm -hmm. um I, I don't know what i looked like because my mum and dad couldn't see it because obviously they lived with me it took someone else outside of like immediate family yeah to notice it and yeah i just looked really pale i was really skinny like, i'm not the tallest now but i was really short for my age yeah. and yeah all the all these symptoms now looking back at it i should have got checked way before I did um, so yeah I got diagnosed just before I was 10 and yeah as you can expect from a 10 year old like it's it, it wasn't easy yeah um, a massive change the day I got I found out I was diabetic I had to go to the hospital and stayed in for about a week just to get used to everything new I had to do because right, I'm not a, I'm not type 2 which is dietary base yeah it's to do with my pancreas this one yeah. and I'm insulin de it's insulin deficient mm -hmm. so my body doesn't produce enough insulin um, hence why I need to take the injections and even now it's hard and there are, there are days where I just can't be bothered, even yeah. today. Like, um, just last week I woke up and I just felt crap. Like, I, I felt fine. Like, I wasn't ill or anything. I just, in my head, I just felt... Sort of I mentally drained. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Mentally drained. Questioning, oh, why? Why is this still happening to me and whatnot? Um, yeah, it's, imagine it's it, hard, it's really yeah, do you feel, like, when, when you do feel, like, mentally, do you feel like something cheers you up, or do you feel like nothing can cheer you up at that point, or, you know, I would like to hear that from you, is there something that helps you in that situation? Not, not so much helps me as like another person that uh, obviously my fiance does all she can um but the the one release I have is music, yeah, and trance music to be completely honest with you because it's just uplifting, and yeah, it can be emotional sometimes, just mu something music about is my it. one true release, yeah yeah. I don't know where I would be without music, to be honest. Like, um, personally myself, I I listen to music every day. There's music oh, on yeah. when I'm working, like just doing paperwork in the background or or whatever. 
walking to or to and from work, going on the bus to work, um, taking the dog for a walk. I've always got music on. I've always got music in my ears because it's the only thing that I can do to pass the time and feel sane, to be honest, in a world of crazy yep. around, you know. And Agreed. It keeps, it keeps me uh, alive, really, because I don't think without music I would be as well i don't think i would be here in some instances because it's really been the only sort of constant in some instances when i went through some bad bad spells in my life i had music on so i think that's good to hear that you had sort of trance music playing in the background you have to bear with me for two seconds I'm just going to close my blackout curtains a little bit over because the sun's decided to come out as soon as i hit live and it was <laughs> You know, it wasn't particularly sunny today in Scotland, so uh, that's so much better for the lighting now. Um, talking, let, let's go and continue on the sort of track of, of diabetes. Obviously, diabetes for you is something you've had, so you see you're 26, you've had it for 16 years. It's 16 years of your life, that is, that is the amount of time it takes for somebody to grow up and be called, well essentially now becoming an adult in some instances you play sports and you do other things that require a lot of exertion how do you manage your diabetes in that instance is there something that you do specifically or or Uh, is there anything specific that you feel like you do there's not really anything specific it's more common sense if you're no, I, I'll hold my hands up here. Like, I've never been a good diabetic. Like, mm. I've never... I've never been how I should be. So, like... I used to not do my insulin all the time and stuff like that, which... If there's any young or newly diagnosed diabetics out there, don't do as I do. Do as I say. Yeah. Like, look after yourself, because... You, you see all these adverts like online on the telly for Cancer Research UK, which is absolutely brilliant and stuff like that. Mm. All these cancer research um, companies trying to find the cure, but you don't see anything for diabetes. Yeah. Like, and in some ways, diabetes, I think, is more likely to be cured. Killer. Yeah. Yeah. And and it causes a lot of of sort of medical issues as well. I mean. There's, there's diabetics in my family who are no longer with us. You know, it reduces life expectancy considerably. Oh, for sure. Um, and the one thing that I always see is, is blindness. And uh, as well, it, it can be a, co- it can cause mus- um, sort of muscular dystrophy in the later ages of, of uh, yeah, later stages of your uh, life. You can, you can lose your hands. You can lose your feet. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's dangerous, um, and I, I so I'm there's only two charities I really donate to, which sounds awful, but one's Help for Heroes, yeah, and the other is Diabetes UK. Help for Heroes is as you'd expect, yeah, but Diabetes UK is close to my heart. Um, the last time I done a 24-hour charity stream, I raised over 600 pound on my own mm-hmm. for Diabetes UK, just from other people donating and stuff like that. So I'm eternally grateful for that. Yeah. The four, the forfeit to reaching my goal. My goal was only 250 pound to raise 250 pound. Yeah, that's crazy. So I more than I more than doubled that. You you tripled it in and some ways. Yeah, yeah. I've essentially tripled it. I think it was like 800 with gift aid or something mm-hmm. as well. Um, and my, something I'd never thought I'd do after it, like, say, if I beat my goal, I'd wear a Tottenham shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so, on, on my, there is a picture on my Instagram of me in, in a Spurs shirt. I bet you get a lot of slack for that, do you? I don't. I don't, actually. A lot of, a lot of Tottenham fans I don't even know got in contact and said that's a, mega feat what you've just done and like you, you would have heard the term cancer has no colors so when yeah. it comes to start, when it comes to medical conditions that let's be honest aren't curable 
Yeah. Or haven't the had a cure. They're terminal. Yeah. yeah. They're terminal, essentially. Yeah. Um, like, disease has no colours. And when it comes to football rivalries, like, I'm, I'm sure there are teams, like, there's people listening in, yourself, there's teams you, like, hate. Oh, yeah. I do have but my teams when, that hate. When it, when, when it comes to terminal illnesses, it doesn't matter what team you support. Oh, exactly. I think... Uh, so there was a there was a sorry there was a young West Ham fan called Isla Caton. Uh huh. Um, she had neutroblastoma, is it? Mm. And she died when she was six. While while she was battling her cancer, mm. there was a Millwall fan that done the London Marathon in a full West Ham kit. Yeah. He then done a run from Millwall's ground, the Den, to. The London Stadium or the Olympic Stadium in a full West Ham kit and on the back of the kit it said Millwall for Isla oh and he like ev- everyone to do with West Ham was just like we may have our differences about clubs but it's it's a person no... it's a person yeah. at the end of the day isn't it yeah and it's the same like there was a guy who had died in it would have been last season. Passed away of cancer. He'd been battling. Well, sorry, he didn't pass away of cancer. He passed away. He'd been struggling with muscular dystrophy all his life. He'd been in a wheelchair and he was getting worse. Uh, I knew him through school. He was only a year older than me. He's always been in a wheelchair as long as I've known him. And he was the strongest Celtic fan I think I ever knew. You know, he he bled green all the time. There would never be a day where he didn't have a Celtic sticker on his sk- uh, on his uh, in his wee electric um, motorised wheelchair, or um, he wouldn't be wearing a Celtic shirt or a Celtic scarf in the winter. He would always be bleeding green somewhere, and he would always come to the county games as a county supporter, but with a Celtic Celtic thing, right? And I think. Nobody ever, ever wanted to take that away from him because he loved football. And that was the one thing he enjoyed, and his name was Dylan. And I'll, I um, I mean, I was in school with his sister. I was in school with him. I had known him growing up, and when I found out that he'd passed, it was very, very sad for me. I was at the game um, that they did a sort of like mini memoriam for him. Uh, they actually gave him a two-minute silence at the start of the game, and at halftime he got a whole, like he got a, basically a whole minutes of applause, because it was actually they did it. They chose to do it on a game that it was Ross County versus Celtic, two teams he held very close to his heart, and literally all of the Celtic support had stood up and were screaming, and we did the same because he was such a nice guy, and it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter if you have a Celtic sticker on your fucking electric scooter as you come into a Ross County game. As long as you like football, and as long as you're supported, and you're supportive of everybody around you, nobody's going to question you, you know? No, exactly. And he's a good, he was a good lad. He was such a nice guy. He always had he always had your best interests at heart when you were talking to him. He was always talking about uh, how one day he was going to play for Celtic, and stuff like that and wheelchair football and stuff and I uh, was like yeah yeah that's a good goal it's a shame he never got a chance to because I think he would have been pretty good at it but um, that's the thing like these guys are you know everybody around us that play football who support anything in, in their life we don't we don't attack each other because we can we try not to do we you know I like no, to end, I like to shit end, on Cal because he's a St Johnston fan, but that's because it, he's a St Johnston fan, and I he lost to us the other day, you know. All, it's all banter at the end of the day. Yeah. When people go out of their way to try and and try and ruin possible. people's lives in some ways as well. Yeah, I've seen try, that. Try and ruin people's lives and try and downplay like successes. Yeah. For them just like I, I've got, I've got it in the 
net recently about West Ham winning the Europa Conference League. From like Chelsea fans, it's just like, oh, it's not the Champions League. It's just like, we're not good enough for the Champions League. But somehow neither are you. <laughs> just see that to yeah. them. But, but like, the, the thing is, like, yeah, the Conference League was brought in for those teams that can't quite make Europe. Yeah. But the, the year before we won it, we we got to the semi-finals of the Europa League. Yeah. Rangers got to the final. Yeah. Which like, just shows we, you. We lost, which both British clubs lost to Frankfurt. And Frankfurt are a good team. Mm -hmm. And this Europa Conference League final that's just gone, it was West Ham Fiorentina, one of the which is one like, of standout the... names in Italy. It's literally one of the big five in, in Italy. Yeah. You know, and I think... For yourself, as a, as a club, you got to be happy that, you know, that you managed to get something. In I, I, I never thought I'd see us win a European competition. <laughs> ever. Definitely. And I think it's the same when it comes to, like, Ross County. I don't think we'd ever... I didn't even think we would ever make it to the top six of the SPFL, but last, like, two seasons ago we did it. Last season yeah. was pretty shit, but this season looks promising, you know. Maybe one day I'll see my club in Europe, but until that point... I can only hope and pray that uh, that they just keep being successful in their way. You, you can never lose your hope, otherwise, what are you doing there? Oh, exactly, exactly. And I'm so like I'm so proud of the team that like that uh, Ross County is as well. And I think that's the important thing is that you're proud of the team that that the managers put together. Um, if you're not, then that's when problems start arising. So. For sure. Let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about racing because obviously we talked a little bit about football. We talked about um, a little bit about yourself. I want to talk about racing, okay? So let's let's do a little bit of fast fire questions, okay? Okay. So you've got to answer with me the first team that comes to your mind as as whatever I say, okay? First thing comes to your mind. Are you ready? Five questions. Yes. Five okay. questions. Okay. Let's go. Favourite F1 team of all time? McLaren. McLaren, cool. Favourite car of all time? That doesn't mean that could be GT, could be just any car, road car if you want to. Ferrari F40. Okay. Ferrari F40. Let's go with the next question, which is favourite driver of all time? Charles Leclerc. Yeah. Oh, of all time? Of all time. All time. That's insane. Fair enough. Favourite driver of the current generation? Charles Leclerc. Charles Leclerc. And finally, your favourite racetrack in the world? Oh, Kyle Army. Kyle Army. Okay, fair enough. So that's a little bit of fast fire questions. Why do you like Kyle Army so much? I don't know. There's something about it. I think my first endurance race was at Kyle Army. And... There's something about the track. It's fast, it's technical, you get it wrong, you're in the hedge. Yeah. Essentially. Um, it, it's kind of got everything you need for a racetrack. Yeah. It's got the slow and technical corners, it's got the rapid, like, long corners, it's got a massive straight down the, uh, from the last corner to what I'm classing as the first corner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's just got everything. It's a bit like Spa. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, Kyle Army and Spa are definitely two of my favourite tracks. Um, but I think Kyle Army just edges it because. Do you feel it's a, a bit a more technical? Yeah, a lot of a lot of people know it, but mm. not a lot of people know it at the same time. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I, I really think F1 should go back there because you can't really class it as a world championship because we don't go to Africa. Yeah, there's literally, n like, the only place closer to that that we've beaten is probably Turkey. Yeah. And that's in the Middle that's East, Asia. you know. Yeah. So it doesn't really add in, does it? And, I mean, Turkey, in a way, is actually still Europe. Half, well, actually, yeah, where yeah, the track half is... The track, half the track's in Europe, half the track's in Asia. Yeah, so it kind of, like... It confuses me as to why the hell, why, why the hell we don't race at Turkey because Istanbul Park is great, but like also oh, it's a great track, yeah. 
Kyle Army if it just been brought up to spec a little bit, you know. Just a little bit, a tiny bit. We could be racing in Africa, you know. The only oh, sure. series that I think is truly a world championship is the WRC. Because they race yeah. on every single continent in well, a rally Antarctica. championship. Yeah, well, Antarctica is a mix of different continents in a way, isn't it? Yeah. Because that's where they've tried to segregate it. But they, it is really just one big continent. But, like, we go all the way up to Finland. All the way down to, well, this year, I think the lowest rally, well, last year was the lowest rally was New Zealand. Yeah. In the Southern Hemisphere. So, and they've raced to Argentina. And, you know, who's to say that we won't race in Argentina again? Argentina's got some fantastic rally roads, some really, really heavy gravel. But, you know, I think that's the truly only world championship that there is because the, well, yeah, cause WEC, WEC isn't, GT isn't, Intercontinental GT Challenge is the only, is maybe another one, but that's because it's a specific championship that races at five different tracks throughout the year. And it kind of yeah. is a mixture. You know, you've got Bathurst at the start. Then you've got Kailami like a week later, two weeks later. And then it sort of like, it goes to Spa. And then it goes to like Indianapolis. And then it's, yeah, it's a weird one. Because I think, why why have all that, you know? Why have all that when you can... The Intercontinental GT Challenge needs to be a bit bigger. In some instances, it needs to be a separate championship. But the SRO... They kind of want to keep it all in one place, um, the way it always has been, but yet they don't race at Laguna Seca anymore, and they don't do this, they don't do that. They're, they're killing it off so that they can have their own sort of major world series of, of GT racing, which I can, I can understand, but, yeah. you know, it's killing itself off and killing anybody else that wants to be a part of it off as well. Like Kenny Havul's team, the Sun Energy 1 car, that beautiful Mercedes, the 75 car that we see race. Uh, it's got the flames at the front of it. You know, that race is Intercontinental GT Challenge, the only one. But yeah, it also competes in IMSA at specific events. It also competes in one-off championships at, like, Dubai. You know, Kenny Habul puts a lot of money in the team, but if he's going to lose a championship out of it because, you know, the SRO is going to take it away, then that's the whole point and purpose of that team gone, you know. He can't race in Australia because there's not enough money to do it there, you know. But yeah, let's move on a little bit more about that. So, you obviously talked about a little bit of your favourite tracks and your, you know, your favourite driver is Charles Leclerc, right? I'm just wondering to find out from you, okay, what attracts you to, like, to a Ferrari driver like that? Oh, um, is it so a bit about me? Like I was a Jensen Button fan, mm. um, and then when Jules Bianchi burst onto the scene, I started supporting Jules. Yeah. Like, like unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Yeah. It's a case of what could have been with Jules, um, and th and then I heard about this this youngster in European Formula 4 who was uh, Bianchi's godson mm -hmm. and um, I was like okay I'll keep an eye on him and I was w I was watching him through his youth career through European Formula 4 when it was available uh, through Formula 3 through Formula 2 then into Formula 1 mm -hmm. and it's it's quite unheard of to go from European Formula Four straight into F three, straight into F two, and then straight into F one. Well, definitely. And that it, he had to have something about him to be able to do that, and we we've seen it. Like Charles Leclerc is rapid. Um, I think he's just being held back by Ferrari. So like, I'm, I I like he's a Ferrari driver. But he's my favourite driver. Doesn't mean I'm a Ferrari fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think Ferrari is holding him back. Yeah. Um, but you got to look at it. There's only really one place he can go from Ferrari to 
potentially be a world champion and it's not going to happen with that Dutch driver, is it? No. So. And I think yeah. um, there's a good opportunity for him opening up now if he wanted to leave Formula 1. But Into the WEC, yeah. I thought, but that doesn't look like it's going to happen either. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at the fact that they're, they would rather put their GT drivers in those cars for the purpose of the fact is, right, they are they they know how how to drive a heavier car, you know, for long distances and a long period of time. That require a lot more care to them than a Formula One car. I think, in in my opinion, anyway, uh, you know, a a prototype is essentially a car that if you push it like a Formula One car, you will end up in a wall because yeah. the car is not the same as the last time you got in it. It's not going to be. It, you know, the setup will be the same. Everything will be the same. But the reality of the situation is you hit a curb the wrong way. Then you've you've maybe pushed that bump stop one or two up by accident, yep. by hitting that bump stop a little bit too hard. You've potentially pushed a wheel out of alignment a tiny bit by one point one of a degree. This is the thing with an endurance team that they manage so well is that you've got to push these cars hard and fast, but also know when to have that sort of mechanical sympathy which i think is where a lot of drivers kind of if you have a good balance of going fast and having mechanical sympathy that's where teams do well and i think that's how toyota have done so well is that they've got they've got a team of reasonably you know in each car they have two out of three drivers that are relatively experienced drivers They've got Brendan Hartley in the number eight and uh, Sebastian Buemi, but Rio Hirakawa isn't so good in some opinion. He literally came through like sort of super super Formula ranks as a youngster, and he's a Toyota prodigy, uh, prodigy, and he went straight in and he's done pretty well for himself. So yeah, fair enough to him. In the number seven car, you've got Kamui Kobayashi, right? Who is by far one of the best best drivers of all time when it comes to endurance now. Um, then you've also got Mike Conway, who's raced in both IMSA and um, also raced in these sort of endurance championships for years. You know, he is probably by far one of the better ones out there. And then you've got a driver who's a touring car driver who's going to have no mechanical sympathy in some ways in uh, Juan Maria Lopez. Because... I mean, let's face it, again, how do you do that? How do you transfer touring car driving <laughs> to a very, very flimsy endurance car? You know, it's difficult to do, but he's done a good job because Toyota have babied him and treated him with the respect he deserves, but also telling him where he's going wrong. So, yeah, I don't know. definitely. Um... Do you think Charles would do endurance if he was given the option? Who doesn't want to race at Le Mans? Oh, exactly. Hell yeah. Um, Max wants to do it. Lando wants to do it. Oh yeah. Charles wants to do it. Have the three like, of them team up. Make a pro driver like Yeah, exactly. Like, they're three of the 20 best drivers in the world. Mm -hmm. And they because could that, be there. That, ultimately, that's the way you've got to look at it. Anyone in F1 is in the top 20 drivers in the world. Hmm. Some ways, because yeah. it's, the top, it's the top of the motorsport ladder, yeah. Uh, no, but, you you, are, you ask young racing drivers what what's your dream to race in Formula One. That's what they'll say. My way of seeing this, right, and I do it on, I I do this based on your FIA license. If you're on a bronze license, you're an amateur. If you're on a silver, then you're sort of still trying to make a name for yourself. So that's like Blakowski and stuff like that, the races in the double eight car and GT World Challenge with Jules Gunon and Raphael Marchiello. You know, you've got two pretty much platinum drivers, two, a gold and a platinum driver racing with you, and you're a silver. How does that work? Um, and anyone sort of like who's got a gold and a platinum license, they have got like to get those you actually need to win one of the sort of major championships you have to have scored a lot of points you need to have won stuff to be able to have that on your name you know against your name 
as a license. And I think that's the thing. Maybe some of these drivers haven't had the opportunity to get there. I mean, like, Logan Sargent didn't really do very too hotly last season in F2, but still got a seat because he was the uh, only yeah, one he, Williams could afford, you he know? He started off well, and then when he realised, oh, my seat's up for grabs here, mm -hmm. he started falling off. Like, he nearly lost it in Abu Dhabi. That's how close it was come yeah. the end of the championship. Um, I'm still one of those guys that think Callum Eilat should have been given a shot. Oh, he should have. He should have been given, like... He was the only one to push Mick Schumacher to that championship mm -hmm. in Formula 2 in 2020. And, unfortunately, he didn't get the seat. I'm going to make it simple, right? Eilat should have been given what is a, basically signs a seat. Signs shouldn't have that seat. Because, in my opinion, Eilat deserved that sort of push in the right direction to get there. Well, for, from what the talk was, it was Schumacher to Alfa Romeo, yeah. and Eilat to Haas, ended or up the other way around. And it just ended up being Schumacher. Because which... Haas wanted two drivers as well. And, well, they got one, and they got a fucking pleb in the yeah. upper car. But, I mean, we don't talk about that guy because he's Russian. Um, but the reality of the situa situation is there's still some good drivers out there that are Russian who have actually switched citizenship. Um, Daniel Kvyat? Yeah. Now Dan in the WEC? Yeah. Well, he can't actually switch citizenship. He just has to drive under no nationality. Yeah. Um, but I was talking about Robert Sportsman. Robert Schwartzman, yeah, he's Israeli now, isn't he? Yeah, is is uh, I think his mum's Israeli, so yeah. he can he, or a member of his family, because I mean that's where Schwartzman comes from. Let's face it, it's sort of a Jewish name. Um, yeah. There's, but that's kind of how it adds up, isn't it? You know, you've got these sort of big names in motorsport, with a bit of money, and it's good that he managed to do that because it means he's not having to associate with Russia, which is fine. But at the same time, you know. I, in a way, I do feel bad for Mazda Spin, but Mazda Spin needs to go somewhere else other than F1. He was never, never cut out for F1, in my opinion. But it's his, it's his words against everybody else's against. Um, let's move on a little bit. Let's kind of continue chatting here. So we've got, we went through all that stuff. Let's talk about International Paddock and yourself because we've got a, me and you have a pretty solid relationship. At like. I've known you for was it coming up to three years? Three years. Yeah, coming up. To yeah. So oh, three years. So, yeah. yeah, we've we've been sort of chatting since probably May twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty. It would have been twenty one. So it's two. Yeah, it would have been twenty one. It was about April twenty one, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, when you add it all up, it's pretty. It's still a long time to know somebody online and never see them face to face, right? You've sort of like come in here to International Paddock, right? Out, out of my request, and uh, t tell tell everybody here what you actually do because I think some people just think that I have people on podcasts because I can. In some ways, I do, but there's actually a degree of of what you act you actually are a member of staff within this community, and uh, maybe people don't know that, so maybe you should give them a heads up. Yeah. So. Um originally I came in just to um, essentially help out around International Paddock. I became a um, driver coach for Team Alba 43, which is an endorsement of International Paddock on yep. ACC. Um, I then became a, a a driver coach slash unofficial team leader. Yep. Um then I did become team leader to just sort of help steady the ship, if you will, within yeah. the racing world. Um, and then recently been promoted to team manager to yeah. um, reduce the workload on yourself, which <laughs> which is greatly appreciated considering yeah. everything that's been going on in my life as well recently. So you've really yeah, sort of helped sure. that way. 
Um, so yeah. you've obviously got that under your belt now. Uh, how are you finding being in that sort of position now as a manager? It's stressful, but I like it. If that makes sense. Mm. Um, you, you don't you don't want to go into a role and it be easy, for essentially. Yeah. Um, go, going back to my footballing career, it's just like I was one or two goalkeepers in my club last season, and I got two games. Like that was the competition I had to come up against. Um, but yeah, like th this season now, I've made the jump to number one goalkeeper and. Essentially, that's what I'm trying to work towards in uh, my racing career as well within International Paddock and Team Alba 43. Um, I, I want to be the best team manager that everyone associated with the community sees. Yeah. I, I, try, I try to be fair, but I need to be harsh at the same time. Um, exactly. I guess having experience from running a league as well kind of come in handy there. <laughs> yeah, it definitely uh, does. You've still got to deal with the same people. Yeah. And it kind of, it all it works out for you as well because these guys are all relatively the, the same sort of people you would have been dealing with in a league almost. So yeah, how does that like sure. how does that work from your point of view? Do you feel like you have that do you feel like you have that down now, or is, is there still sort of struggles there for you? I wouldn't say there's struggles, but there's always opportunity to learn. Yeah. Um, like, n no day is going to be the same. Some some days you'll wake up and there'll be nothing to deal with, but... Then it I, all happens I, I got, at once. Yeah, I got back from football training yesterday, and... Yeah. <laughs> it we all went, kicked we went, off. Yeah. 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 I I just remember coming back. I went to see uh, Gran Turismo yesterday, and as soon as I get in the door, I'm getting hounded for phone calls, <laughs> conversations. Yeah. I had Sambo on the line. I had you on the line. I had Mike asking what the hell's going on, and I'm like, what the hell do I have to deal with now? I just want to go to my bed. I've just watched a long movie, <laughs> yeah, but I still had yeah. to. I still had to hop on and deal with that because that's that's part of the job, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Um, and I think from your like point of view is is pretty pretty good actually because there's some days where nothing happens and there's that sort of midday lull and now that yeah. it all just tends to fucking happen at once so yeah but that that's the way it goes doesn't it um yeah there's all there's, like i said there's always opportunity to improve and kind of works though yeah, for you because yeah, this is works. a stepping stone in the right direction in you, in your career as well because I mean you've got drivers in one side of the stick that are going to make the cut and there's drivers in the other end that aren't but it's about guiding them isn't it yeah to help them get there it's all, it's all about the right mentality yeah um, just like an another part of my job is not not just to be there for the racing team but to be there for the racing team on a mental level. Yeah. Um, so like if they're not feeling right, I want them to have the confidence to come to me and tell me what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then I can go from there to see how I can help them and if there's anything we as an organisation can do. Because um, there's plenty of ways of support out there. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it just takes that kind of confidence to talk as well, which is a good thing. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, I've had my struggles in the past, and I've openly talked about that on stream and um, to the community as well. They know my struggles. But having a good group of guys around you is enough to keep you stable, keep you sane. Sure. I think that's For the sure. thing that these drivers, some of them are relatively new to the, the scene, and they don't know exactly what to say. They, they don't feel like they can talk up and, and, and speak. And I think that's the the thing we've got a conversation it's a conversation starter that's needed to bring yeah. something out of them that maybe they didn't realize they had or or whatever and we can help them through whatever the issue is rather than be in a situation where they're not really able to talk um and i think that's a good thing because not everybody wants to talk about their issues online not everybody wants to talk about their issues to somebody they've never met but 
sometimes it's just a little bit of like a nudge in the right direction gives them a chance to open up and vent maybe to keep them alive for a little bit longer mentally uh, <laughs> rather than going down a rabbit hole um, and I think that's good though because I think I, li I like to think that I, I set you up nicely for this position so that you could get this you know I didn't just hand it to you and say right it's your ship to fucking go with now you just take it I wanted to make sure that you were content you know there was sort of a little bit of a kind of uh, probably from about this third round on from there we were working together on decisions and showing you my yep. thought process and how I wanted things to be done and then I give you a little bit on how to sort of manage people's sort of mental state and their mental health in, in many ways as well and just try and keep them going in the right direction rather than doing things and I mean it's just yeah I, I like to think that I helped try and set you up right for that so that you could do this because it's it is it's the, for the benefit of of me and the group of international paddock but also to the benefit of everybody else in the team so it's a yeah it's a good help for that side of things now let's let's kind of move away from that side of things now let's let's talk about your love of racing because we wouldn't be in this situation right now if you didn't have an intense passion for anything with an engine and four wheels or two wheels so i mean we talk about simulators right what yep. is your sort of go-to simulator to play? A sort of course of competition, Why is that? What do you feel about that game that sort of gives you that feeling of wanting to go back to it all the time? I think it's just addicting. Um, there's not really anything to it. Like, I've got R Factor, I've got a set of course, uh, and I've got obviously the flight and the truck sims as well but I, I haven't really delved into any other simulator mm -hmm. so obviously it's something I know it's something I, I, I think I'm relatively good at and that again there's always room for improvement but it, it's what it's why I'm working team Alba 43 so hard for this 24 hour of spa coming up yeah because we have there's 82 cars on the grid. I saw that. It's full grid. Race. Full fucking um, grid. There's about 107 drivers in it. Mm. Like, if you want to compete, you need to compete against these teams that you've never heard of, and you don't know how they're going to do. Um, ACC is just... Like, the community is really helpful, and there's not really any... What's the word? drama as such yeah um, there's a little bit of drama here and there when people are using grip hacks but that seems to be getting stamped out a little bit more by ray stewarding which is really yeah. good to see uh, sure. but com compared to f1 <laughs> like yeah i'm not even going to go into that rabbit hole um it always seems to be something with like the formula one um online community <laughs> the, the, the f1 thing. online community is just toxicity mm -hmm. That's that's the word I'd use to describe it. Um, the the sad truth yeah. is that we want to try and like I remember when I tried to set this up was that I tried to pull some F one drivers away from F one. That was one thing that I wanted to do. Drivers that I saw potential in, people that wanted to actually had the had the balls to stand up and say, actually, I want to try a simulator. I actually want to race somewhere else. I want to try something new. That was the people that really appealed to me when I was setting up Team Alba 43. People that wanted a shot. But a th this is, this is why I'm impressed with Claudio, or uh, Wheeze, as people would know him. Yeah. Um, he's pulling away from F1 completely. He's mm -hmm. coming here to race. So he messaged me when he signed the contract the other day. I'll get, I'll get the message up, actually. Um, where is it? Um... Bear with me, guys. It's all right. I mean, Weez is a good driver. We knew that from when he raced in a few sort of exhibition races that uh, Option 13 were doing as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the reason why I brought him in as well as uh, sort of Tice as well. Uh, two drivers from Option 13 that were in need of a... Of a bit more of a better sort of stable environment in some ways that where everybody was focused on the same thing 
and like that's the thing that I want to say is that we've got this opportunity in Team Alba 43 to, to do something great and give drivers opportunities to to be signed by bigger teams to be signed to get paid to race in endurance championships in in sprint championships because they're quick and I can see Claudio be probably one of the best drivers that ACC has to offer potentially moving yeah. forward as well right. Yeah, he me he messaged me ten days ago saying just wanted to say a huge thank you for my first semi pro contract ever. So like we're the we are the first team to be paying him. Yeah. I'm really happy that you want me racing with you, gents, and I'm looking forward to what the future holds. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my my response was just it's my pleasure. I know how good you are on F one and I know what you can become if you re put, really put your mind to it on ACC. Like but he's guys really yeah, for sure. He he really wants to do well within Team Alba 43. Um, yeah, and... We just hope to be able to give... So, not only do we want to push drivers in the right direction by getting them fast, but we want to instill the discipline of being able to get into a, a lobby and a session and just give it hell for lever and get data and drive quickly and feel good about themselves for doing that because i think in some instances with drivers some of them don't really want to do it you know some some drivers are here just for the ride and that's fine as long as they're doing everything that you ask of them and then that's the thing as long as we can t see that and then when it comes to teams hunting for drivers and potentially for drivers to be contracted in other teams i just hope and i hope and i pray that some of the drivers can just see that their opportunities are, are their are their own and that they're not limited the whole point of team alba 43 is to give them the opportunity to race to give them the opportunity to go off and do something different and to start their esports journey in some ways because he deserves he deserves a contract like he's, sure. not, he's only done one race with the boys in reality and i was you know i don't even think he's probably did he did he compete at spa he didn't compete at spa no he, so, he didn't take part in the last season no. yeah so he didn't compete in any of the last season but I, i've seen him previously he deserves a contract with the boys, he deserves to be going quickly. The only thing is, he's going to have a lot of weight in the shoulders because we have seen that. So it's about him yep. delivering that opportunity to himself and saying, "Look, here I can wake up and I can drive fast." You know, and I think yeah, Team Alba Forty Three is is a good outlet for a lot of the drivers to be able to push and go quickly with. So, um, yeah, and, let's... and another one, oh. another one, Daniel has come in. Like... Yeah. This was just this was just for Watkins Glen. Mm. He was looking for a team for the twenty four hours and lo and behold the following week he um he, he was in the team for the four hour Watkins Glen. Well yeah. only, unfortunately only one of the cars qualified, but it's still qualification. And the boys deserve as, it, you know? Yeah, as far as far as I know we've qualified. Um I'll hope and yeah. wait and see about that message coming through. If not, then I'll have to read through the rules again for what's happening with that. Um, yeah. But the overall is that the boys competed in a Pro-Am Championship and got a podium. So, yeah. in, in, in a hard, we, we, hard we field. In sixth overall as well. Mm -hmm. So, Which is good. Yeah, but we really were good. like both cars were next to each other in terms of finishing. So, which to me yeah, makes my good. life so much easier, you yeah. know. And the boys can really kind of hold their head up high as well, um, in saying that they've really pushed quite hard to get where they needed to be as well. So, Brad yeah, is a good driver. In, in, in the world, it's uh, any, any publicity is good publicity, mm -hmm. is the saying. Um, obviously, that goes both it's ways bit, yeah it goes both ways like you don't, you don't want to be publicly known for murdering your best friend <laughs> but <laughs> like that that's the sort of premise like 
and Brad Slate's his son. I'm so impressed with Brad. I'm so glad that David mentioned him to me that is a driver yeah. that could take part in his place when he was on holiday because now Brad has essentially not taken David's slot but has essentially come in and has been a godsend to work with. He is, oh, for sure. He's a funny guy and he, he works so hard and like he reminds me of when I as well and it's just a shame that Winai's sort of availability sort of fell off the cliff a little bit because I think Winai has that opportunity and that that possibility to be great. It's just he lets yeah. himself down sometimes. The same with a lot of drivers. They do let themselves down by their actions. And I think in some ways I'm proud to say that the team's got gotten bigger for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. Yeah, for and sure. The guys are working hard together, which is good. Uh, let's slowly move on to sort of one of the last topics and it's just like let's talk a little bit about yourself when it comes to sort of racing and stuff like that so you, what what's the sort of preferred cars you like to race because i know obviously you're competing in papa champs you're competing in and obviously you've we've got sfr started back up again soon in in september in sort of gt cars this time yeah you know let's talk about that because you want to really be not exclusive but exclusive to something what's your sort of go-to car to race i think now nowadays it's definitely endurance racing yeah um so gt mainly um yeah G gt just seems to be i don't i don't know like that round one of the Porsche Cup I do on Wednesdays, I got two podiums, and I was at, you can see it on the stream. I was absolutely over the moon. Oh yeah. Just because I've never I've never driven the Porsche Cup cars. I'm around people that have driven Porsche Cup cars, and I've managed to finish third both races. And it's just, I think the sense of achievement in GT slash endurance racing is greater. Yeah. That like, even if you're not on the podium you could have a really good race and you can like, we'll take the 24 hour spa coming up for instance mm -hmm. there was 82 cars there if we're in the top half of that then that's a win in oh, our yeah. eyes because obviously l looking at the times currently there are a few semi pro teams in there now um that have all sponsorship and stuff. So if we if we can get Team Alba Forty Three into the top half of the field without essential sponsorship by the likes of Moser, Thrustmaster, Logitech, and all that, then I think that could really open the door for other like potential sponsorship opportunities coming in. See, this is the thing. Get... Like with sponsorship right now, you guys got sponsored by a small a small amount a tiny amount really in the grand scheme of sponsorship but it was enough to be able to help pay some of the bills for you guys it paid exactly a, it paid a small chunk of what you guys were owed for your wages and also paid it basically covered for all of our expenses i i had said that the expenses would be around about 50 it didn't end up that way. It ended up a bit higher, so I end up paying it a little always bit more ends up higher. Yeah, what um, people may not know is that we're running a yes, we're running a racing team on a simulator, but it still costs. Like, because I'm not going to sit here and just say drivers, I'm not paying you at all for for putting on all this time and effort to get to the end of the race. No, I think that's what makes Team Alpha Forty Three and International Paddock different from others out there. Mm -hmm. Um. Obviously, we do it for the love of the sim as well. Right? We, oh, we yeah. absolutely love driving, but that that's just an extra bit of incentive to say, right, we re really put our minds to this. We could be up there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think what you're, what you're doing within International Paddock is absolutely brilliant. He hasn't paid me to say that. No, nope, he's not been paid um, specifically for that, but he was paid for the racing. So, um, <laughs> And to... This is something that everybody else should know as well. Jamie doesn't get paid for being a, a team manager. 
He doesn't. No. The drivers get paid because they're, in my opinion, even though I do believe that the management do deserve to be paid in some ways, the drivers are the one that makes it happen. Jamie is there to facilitate everything for you guys, and I think that's the important thing. I like that. I like that sort of mentality. It's sort of a communist mentality, in my opinion, of... Yeah, there's similarities yeah. to it. But it's um, it's more pushing, it's it's more pushing towards the people that are driving the cars to be able to earn to be paid from the guys like myself. Because that, that again, that yeah. it does seem very capitalistic that I'm saying this, but I do not get paid for for any nope. of, any of you guys to drive. I essentially donate money, free willing, to you guys to make sure that you guys are successful. Yeah. And Mike does the same. Um, uh, we we, we, we know, don't Sam pay the too. drivers. Yeah, we don't pay the drivers just for showing up. That they do have to hit their targets. Oh, exactly. There is right. a lengthy list of things that we had to, like the drivers had to do last season, to even think about getting paid. And yeah. you know, it's a good thing that a good percentage of the drivers got paid for their races. I think there was only two instances where specific drivers didn't get paid. Um, yeah. And that's, and they were two separate incidents, and they both understood why they didn't get paid. And they were, you know, and some and most of it was due to real life stuff that they could have let us know about, so that we would have been able to facilitate. And it's yeah, just sure. the nature of the situation is that all the drivers are important to me. They're important to Jamie. They're important to everyone. I think as well. Yeah, um, they definitely are. And I mean. When you talk about your sort of chosen simulator, could we see Team in, Team Alba Forty Three maybe branch out into something else in the future as well? That is in the works. Um, I, I am looking at stuff we can do. Uh, there are a few championships that I'd like us to enter into. Um, it's just about finding the drivers. Um, yeah. I do have another Scotsman I talk to a yeah. lot that. Uh, that isn't part of International Paddock just yet, but um, he does Maybe a lot of stuff day. on the iRacing. So, um, I'm, I'm looking at getting into iRacing as well, and who knows, we, we could have a um, Team Alba 43 hypercar that we'll yeah. be in at some point as well. And that would be something that I'd be interested in racing with. <laughs> I like sure. the hypercar. I, I know, I, I know Tyson oh. would want to do it as well. So. Yeah, and I think it's just about I like to think of all of our sort of things as being expeditions into something unknown for everybody. So, if the boys wanted to take part in these events, it's it's expensive, but like these guys, you know, it's about experience. It's about trying different things, and I, that's the thing I want from all these guys is to try new things, but to find their forte, to find their passion within a world of sim racing that is so vast now you know there's so many options of simulators so many options to yeah. things to race like you know there's people out there that race primarily just dirt rally 2.0 barely touch any other simulator game but they go on every morning and they're on throughout the whole day to play rally from it's like a nine to five job for them they just play rally all day on stream and that's their job because they like yeah. that they that's their thing and if that's what drivers want to do, then that's what they'll do. But, like, the yeah. It's just about trying to push in the right direction. Um, Let's slowly wrap this up, right? And I want to get back towards yourself, because obviously SFR is starting back up again, right? It had a bit of a rocky ending to its season last time out. Yep. You know... What do you think is going to be different now when we're going into ACC instead of Formula 1 that's going to be much better for you to deal with? The toxicity, I think. Um, yeah, obviously people knew we, we had a Formula 1 league, we had multiple divisions. Um, and so, something went on which I'm not going to dive into too, um, too much. Because um, those of you, those of you listening that were there knew what happened. Um, it got all out of hand. It got blown way out of proportion as to what it was. Um, 
and essentially we're just trying to wipe the slate clean and go down a direction that most other leagues wouldn't have thought of. Um, I think ACC promotes better better ways to conduct yourselves. Um, yeah, definitely. It's probably a lot more sportsmanship based as well. And I think when you've got such heavy hitters in the community that yeah. are very nice as well, it kind of shapes a community. Well, I mean, yeah, just but... to name just to name three drivers in the community right now that probably have a massive influence on everybody around them and, and how they conduct themselves. Probably Dan Suzuki, um, Rory Alexander, and also probably Jardier. So the three big yeah. hitters in that community at the moment, and Rory Alexander is probably probably one of my sort of top creators of this year with the amount of content he's been pushing out on YouTube and like he does a lot of Gran Turismo 7 which I'm d I don't have a PlayStation 5 so I don't play Gran Turismo I don't have a steering wheel on for the for the PlayStation go on for the Xbox and we were talking about that last night cuz I just went to see Gran Turismo in the in the cinema and um ACC is something that is not everybody's cup of tea and he says that like he doesn't want to be doing ACC all the time but the one thing he does like is going on to LFM and racing and being part of a community of drivers and, you know, getting that competitive racing. It's something that's a little bit more sort of based around one th car, one one type of spec racing. And I think he likes that. And I think he's so good at it as well. I think he's... So Rory, if you listen to this, mate, this is for you. You should come and say hello to me, my friend, because I would love to have a chat about your sort of racing and stuff like that. But Jardier, everybody knows Jardier. And Dan Suzuki, you know, um, if anyone watches him on Twitch, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. Dan Suzuki, uh, he is a pretty cool guy, very quick as well, and down to earth as well. These guys really are the smiles in a community that sometimes gets a bit heated about certain things, but never seems to go to head with each other, which is really good to hear. Uh, but then when you look at F1, <laughs> hmm, <laughs> wonder yeah, who we could name so there that could cause some issues. Um, yeah, multiple. There's unfortunately too many creators in F1 that are very, very negative towards each other in some instances, and it doesn't end up very well for a lot of people. I mean, look at the fact that was it Bushy Ants decided to leave F1 yep. and streaming completely because of a community you know and I mean that's, that's such a cliche thing because it's Formula 1 but people were wanting to give him shit about everything which is really sad to see unfortunately but yeah yeah. I, I don't know what, what's your sort of opinions on that I, I, I just echo your opinions to be honest like you, you know my you, you know my experiences in Formula 1 um, there was always more people in Formula One that were wanting to have your head, yeah, for their own incidents, yeah, that they um, caused rather than talk about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I'd like to see F One get back to where it was mm -hmm. at some point, but I just don't see it happening anytime soon, unfortunately. You've got too many uh, walls. Which in that community yeah which which just makes like other racing series like acc s communities so much better but uh, one, one of the best communities that i haven't even mentioned is flight sim oh god yeah we I, uh, the last sort of thing that i wanted to mention i completely forgot you're a bit of an aviation buff aren't you and a little bit yeah yeah and i mean that's one of many things that me and you share together we like planes we like flight flying planes I actually had suggested that we did a flight at the same time as doing this podcast to show people and something to talk about, but I think at the same time it was a good idea just to get this podcast done, this sort of candid pit stops and let's talk about this. I think this deserves a bit of time on it because you're a bit of an aviation buff. Let's talk yep. about that. So you fly mostly on that sim now. Um, how are you finding that? Absolutely love it. It's just... 
it just adds realism to a sim that was already stupidly good. Oh yeah. Um, like that sim, that sim's been around for years. Oh yeah. Like, I, I, I've watched Air Force Proud for a number of years when it was on <laughs> old, the old FSX, and that sim was there. Holy um, shit! A fucking hot air balloon is when space shuttle yeah. starts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's just so good. Um, not because I know Kirby likes flight sim as well, and he's working towards getting a PC to be able to join on bat sim as well. Yeah. Um, I, I can't really explain it. It's just it, it gives you a sense because my dream job when I was younger was to be a pilot. When I got diagnosed with diabetes, I got asked, "What do you want to do?" As a career, I, like, I want to be a pilot. I like, you can't be a pilot. So it just shattered my dreams in about 30 seconds when yeah. I found that out. But that sim and flight sim nowadays, like the, how it's handled and how it looks, how it feels, is just. It allows you to be a pilot from the comfort of your own home. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah, and yeah, I don't, I don't think I'll ever lose love of mm-hmm. flying. It's just I've been brought up with it. Uh, a week before I was born, my dad dragged my mum to Fairford for the air show. A week later, I was born, so I was at an air show before I was even born. And yeah, it's just I, I've got an absolute admiration of all things aviation it's just do you feel like a a lot of like when you're flying sorry when you're flying do you feel like you're at home i do i do um aviation's got so much to it it's not just about flying it's about the experience as well like I, i I go plane spotting at Heathrow whenever I get the chance, if I'm down back at my mum's. Uh, Same as my dad, he does it. Um, A a lot of people say, oh, why why do you like planes so much? Andrew, why do you like cars so much? Yeah, it's it's such a silly question, but it's it's something that we all stick with. I think if somebody was to ask me why I like things that move, I would say to them, well, then... I don't like you, but you still move, you know. Yeah. But it's it it's the the love of motion. It's the love of technology. It's the love of seeing these things moving without us, like having to do anything. You know, you could sit in a passenger seat in a car, and all all your mum and dad needs to do is put you know put the clutch down, put it in gear, and then lift the clutch and go. And it's just that sort yeah. of knowing that it's the technology that's behind these pieces of equipment that to me inspires me to want to do things like that you know well yeah look at formula one it takes aviation engineering and literally flips it literally instead of a instead of trying to instead of it producing lift it produces downforce yeah and you on the road like i mean you you know what i was doing in college i mean you know that like I, i worked a little bit of a course on things dynamics fluid dynamics and the way that the air reacts when it hits objects certain objects uh, of, of why they they paint cars in different materials to try them and it's you know air can be weird air does stupid things but the it one can thing be, it can be thick it can be really thin it can yeah. be it can be both at the same time yeah and it it's, doesn't know how to yeah. di- how to manage itself. And the one thing that all these things have in common is that they work in a weird and unusual but beautiful way. They all connect together in some sense. So I really like that. And I think I, I admire your love of flight sim because I like flying as well. I mean, we, we both like flying different things, but I do like flying airliners. Yeah, I just like something that's a bit smaller that requires a little bit more maintenance. Something that feels like if I was to do something wrong with it, it's going to fall out the sky um, and only kill two people, me and the pilot, uh, me and the, the co-pilot. Whereas <laughs> if I was to fly an Airbus, I'd probably <laughs> drop out of the sky 
and um, kill all all hundred something passengers, myself <laughs> and the go uh, the first officer, and um, probably tons of people on the ground. Um, <laughs> but it's like I still love flying those things because it's some it's a love of aviation, um, like the seven three seven that we've been flying quite a lot off stream and on stream. Um, that's a plane that is notorious. It's beautiful and it's it's interesting. You know, when ATR when the ATR comes to your controls, I know for a fact being you the first thing we're gonna be doing is hopping in an ATR forty two or a seventy two and learning yep. that bitch and flying it like mad. You know, because right now I'm learning everything about props and turbo props so that when I do transfer over to the ATR I know what I'm doing, you know? Um, yeah, for sure. And I've been flying a lot of the BN2 Islander, so I like it. I'm going to be learning the BN2-3 or the BN3 Trilander, which has got the third engine on the roof, well, on the tail. Um, and I'm going to be learning that as well, because I want to learn these planes. I do. And there is something special about these planes to me, as they're a sort of coming to the change in aviation, you know. And that's that's my love of them. And that's why, when people ask me why I'm flying a shitty little BN2 Islander everywhere at the moment, it's because, well, because this plane pretty much kept Scotland connected when Scotland wasn't. So, that's why I say, yeah, for sure. that, that's, that's where just, I say the things. Other day as, yeah, just the other day as well, you, you were doing flights in the north of Scotland, and we done a bit of role play, didn't we? We did, like, literally. Uh, <laughs> I, I intercepted him in a... You're a, a typhoon from which Glossy Mouth. Which and... looked like a fucking A330, which was... <laughs> yeah, which which we can sort out for the next stream, because yeah. all Andrew needs to do is install the typhoon, uh, yeah. get, in, get in it, and then go back to the main menu, and yeah. then he'll be able to see it. Yeah. So... It's it's quite interesting, because I think... Um, the, B, the BN2 is such a small little plane... <laughs> You've got an A330 yep. intercepting you doing power rolls and shit. It's like, um, <laughs> hmm, I think we need to actually get that uh, Typhoon model and stuff, get that sorted out. But, uh, no, I really yeah, like, sure. I really like the way that your sort of enthusiasm as well. You've been a great help with me when it comes to doing ATC stuff, which I'm always going to ask you about certain things because I'm so fucking scared when I'm chatting on ATC. I really don't. Like I hate it. I hate the thought of somebody having to hear my voice um, on over ATC so that if I say something wrong, I know I'm going to get an aviation bollocking. Whereas online, I'll look on here, uh, like I'm doing comms or whatever, th nobody can touch me. They can try, and I'll just be like, <laughs> suck my dick. <laughs> you know, but I can't exactly say that down the comms on Vatsim because I'll probably get banned. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's good. it's good to know what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. But yeah, let's slowly wind this down to an end. Guys, thank you very much for watching this episode of Candid Pit Stops. This has been episode two in this little mini series that we're doing of getting to know the drivers that you race against. And it's been a pleasure having Jamie here. Uh, thanks for being here, Jamie. It's been a little bit of uh, sort of working around schedules, but we're here now. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for having me. Yeah. And if you guys want to join in on SFR, all you need to do is join our Discord, which will be in the link in the description as well, if you're watching on YouTube. And you can also access it on our Twitch as well. It'll be there. Um, and join in via that way, and you can access SFR and everything it has to offer. If you want to race on Xbox and ACC, then they've got it covered. If you want to race on PC with ACC, they've got it covered as well. So all that link's down in the description below. Thank you very much for watching. And... This has been Cannon Pit Stops with Jamie O'Connor. We'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.